we are talking about Mormonism. Have you ever wondered where the, where the word Mormon comes from? Uh, you know, it wasn't but just a few months ago that the leadership of the uh, Church of Latter-day Saints uh, said that they didn't want to be called Mormons anymore. Now, that's kind of a, you know, that's a hard thing to just change when people are used to saying something. But um, w where does that word Mormon come from? Mormon was a, was a man, and actually one of the books in their scriptures, in the Book of Mormon, one of the books is the Book of Mormon. Well, the whole thing's called the Book of Mormon, but there's one specific book that's called the Book of Mormon. And Mormon was a prophet warrior from ancient America before anything we know about in our history. Uh, before Native Americans, before settlers, before colonists, before anybody showed up, there was this ancient civilization. By the way, there's no historical documentation. There's no archaeological de documentation. But there was this ancient group of, of pre-history Americans, and Mormon was the uh, prophet and warrior for that group. So that's where the name comes from. And... Um, it has been passed down uh, since the beginning of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Now, I notice on the little handout you got, latter is misspelled. That says Church of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> it should be two T's. It is Latter-day Saints, uh, commonly called the Mormons. You will also see it LDS. LDS is just simply an abbreviation for Latter-day Saints. So, if we were talking about what Mormons believe, and if I were to say to you that a person was running for office, this happened just a few years ago, a man ran for president, and uh, his faith was questioned because it was unusual to a lot of people. And so, uh, people started asking him, reporters and in debates and things, people would raise that issue and ask him questions. Now, if that person, Mitt Romney in this case, if he says, I believe... Uh, that Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. And if that person, Mitt Romney, was an honorable person and a moral person and active in his church and uh, a good upstanding citizen, you would have a good general impression, right? He said the right things. But would it change your impression if you came to find out that he believes... That God was once a man and became God. And that God has a wife in heaven. And that uh, their first spirit child was Jesus. And their, another one of their spirit children was Satan. And that Jesus and Satan are actually brothers. Would that change your thoughts any? Well, that's, that's the reality. So here's the problem when you're talking about really any um, any group, you have to know definitions. And when you're talking about Latter-day Saints, Mormons, uh, they will use the same words that we use. They will talk about God. They will talk about Jesus. They will talk about grace. They will talk about salvation. They will talk about all of those things. But it means something different than what you and I understand from the Bible. So you've got to understand what a person is saying. Now, I, I, I've said this every week that we've done this. Bruce has said this. But we, we want to be very clear about this. We are not really criticizing people. You know, there are some wonderful people in the Mormon uh, church. There are some wonderful people. They are good family people. They are moral people. They are honest people. They're the kind of people that would make good neighbors. That would be a good friend to you. Uh, we're, we're not really trying to bash. We're just trying to help understand the differences between our faith and the church of the Latter-day Saints in the case tonight. So I hope you hear the spirit of that. You know, um, and, and what I'm going to try to do tonight is really not to make a lot of commentary or give a lot of opinion or, or, you know, go this way or that way with my own thoughts. I'm going to really try to be pretty uh, clear in just reading what their documents say. I just want you to hear what their documents say without me interpreting it. Without saying, well, this is, I mean, you, can, you got ears. 
You got a brain. So you can hear what the documents say. And you know what you, what we believe and what scripture says. And so that's really what I want to do. And I'll spend a lot of time just reading some things to you out of their particular documents. Well, let me give you some, some just some quick facts. And these aren't on your handout. So there's, uh, we left you a little space on the back. If you want to make some notes, you can do that. Let me just tell you a little bit about the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Um, the key figure... Uh, the founder of the church is a man named Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith was born in 1805 and he died in 1844. He was born in Vermont, but when he was 12 years old, his family moved to New York and that's where he spent his teenage years. When he was 15 years old, now think about that for a moment. When he was 15 years old, he says that God came to him and that God gave him a vision, a word. And what God told him was that there was no true church on earth. All churches are apostate. They have all fallen away from the truth. And that he should not be engaged, involved, a part of any church. And that he was going to establish the original church. He was going to restore the original church from the times of Jesus. So, a 15-year-old boy uh, was supposedly visited by an angel named Moroni. Moroni, by the way, is the son of Mormon. I told you Mormon was the prophet um, warrior of the uh, ancient American, whatever, whoever it was before anything we know about history here in North America, Mormon was that person and this uh, Moroni was his son. And, and so this Moroni visited Joseph Smith in a vision and he told him about some golden tablets, where they were located. And if he would uh, go and find those golden tablets, that it would give him information that he needed um, both about our American uh, history, about our civilization, about um, in, in, in Joseph Smith's writings about a migration of the Jewish people from the Middle East to America. This is nothing that's recorded in any history. This is nothing we have any archaeological evidence about. This is nothing that's documented in any way, but that the Jewish people from the Middle East migrated to North America, and uh, this is where all of this started. So, as a result of this visit by the uh, angel Moroni, in 1830, Joseph Smith published the Book of Mormon. He established the church. It was first called the Church of Christ. He established it in New York. And he said it was the only true church on earth. He stayed in New York until he was forced to leave. And he moved, uh, he started it in 1830 in New York in 1831. So it was kind of short-lived. In 1831, he moved to Ohio. And then uh, they didn't really accept him there. And he moved to Missouri. And uh, Missouri wasn't uh, too thrilled with it either. And he was forced to leave there and he went to Illinois. And when he was in Illinois, there was a newspaper there that began to publish um, articles about what these people believed and what they said and how they lived. And, and uh, so there was kind of an uprising among the people again. And uh, I, I, I don't know this for a fact. I'm just surmising that Joseph Smith must have decided that he was tired of leaving and he was going to fight. And so there was kind of an insurrection. He tried to destroy the newspaper that was publishing these articles. Uh, there, was a, uh, there was a sentiment on both sides. And he ended up being arrested. And um, he actually surrendered when he saw that he was in danger of his life being taken. Uh, he surrendered to the governor of Illinois and he was put in jail. And while he was in jail, a mob broke in and killed him. So that's where Joseph Smith's life ended um, after he had gotten this church established. So then there was some question about who the next leader was going to be. And the next leader is a name that you will recognize. His name is, uh, was Brigham Young. 
Brigham Young was actually a Methodist minister, but he had bought into this new movement, this concept. And in 1844, he became the leader. And in 1846, he moved the church to Utah. And that's where the heart of the church has been since that time. So now, think, keep in mind these dates that I'm giving you historically. Uh, this is very young. You know, we're talking about our Christian faith uh, going back thousands of years. We're talking about the life of Jesus going back 2,000 years. And we're talking about a, a movement here that supposedly is the only true church on earth that is uh, a, a, a rediscovery of the original church, and it is just a few hundred years old. A couple of more dates that you might find interesting. It was in 1852 that Brigham Young acknowledged that polygamy was a part of this um, group and that it was encouraged for people to have more than one wife. Uh, in 1890, 1852 is when that happened. By 1890, the federal government had gotten involved in that, and it was not acceptable. And so in 1890, a manifesto was issued saying that polygamy was no longer uh, the policy of the church. And then one more interesting uh, date, if, if you're interested, it was in 1878 that uh, the Latter-day Saints Church really opened themselves to uh, blacks. Until that time, it had been a pretty closed, um, uh, it's still predominantly white, but uh, it, it uh, opened in the 70s to allow uh, blacks even to be priests. Uh, how many uh, Latter-day Saints are there? Worldwide, there are 15.8 million. 15.8 million. Just as a comparison, that's about the same number of Southern Baptists. We are one, we are one branch of Baptist. There are many kinds of Baptist. And we are one denomination of Christians. There are many denominations of Christians. You have friends that are Methodist Christians and Presbyterian Christians and Lutheran Christians and the Assembly of God Christians and, and non-denominational Christians. So just us, uh, we are roughly the same size. But the uh, Church of Latter-day Saints, according to U.S. News and World Report, is the fastest growing faith group in the world. And they say that if they continue to grow at the rate they're growing right now, the 15.8 million right now, if they continue to grow at the rate they're growing right now, by the year uh, 2080, which is what, 62 years away? Uh, so in one more lifetime... Uh, the number will be over 250 million at the rate that they are growing now. So it is the fastest growing group. Uh, just in case you're curious, 58% of that 15.8 million, 58% live in North America with most of those in the United States. 25% live in South America and the, the, the rest of it, that, whatever that is, 16, 17%, whatever it is, they live in the rest of the world, Europe, Asia, Africa, um, all of the other places. It's estimated there are about 6.6 .6 million uh, Mormons in the United States. And if you're curious about Tennessee, uh, you know most Mormons live out west. 76% of the uh, Latter-day Saints in the United States live in the western states. And uh, as far as the deep south, the Bible Belt that we would call it, there are about 12% that live in the south. In Tennessee, there are just over, just a few hundred, over 50,000 people that are part of a Latter-day Saint uh, church. So to compare that, our city here in Hendersonville has about 57,000 people, something like that. So the, the Tennessee population of uh, Mormons is a little less than the, the population of the city of Hendersonville. There are a lot of famous Mormons. Name, names, shout out some names of some people that, you, that are famous that are Mormons. The, did I hear somebody say the Osmonds? Yeah, the Osmonds. They, they are. Mitt Romney. I already said Mitt Romney. Johnny Miller. Who? Harry Marriott, yes, the, the, the founder of Marriott. His name is uh, Bill, Bill Marriott, yes. Let me read a couple of names. The Osmonds, you name Mitt Romney. Steve Young, 
former uh, football player, NFL commentator now, Bill Marriott, uh, Catherine Heigl, the actress, uh, Glenn Beck, political commentator, uh, Stephen Covey. You know, Stephen Covey writes some great books. I bet you've read uh, Seven Effective Habits of a uh, Seven Habits of an Effective uh, Person. Yeah, uh, and I think he's got one on Habits of a Successful Family. He's got a lot of great books. Uh, Stephen Covey, an author, is also uh, Mormon. So let's jump into this now. If you'll take this and kind of follow along, uh, I'm going to read some things to you. I want you to hear what their documents say. And as I said, I'm really trying not to just make a lot of commentary. I just want us to, to know what the difference is. They hold four books to be authoritative. They say the Bible, but here's the kicker. The Bible as far as it is translated correctly. And Joseph Smith did a lot of correcting. Joseph Smith said that a lot of it was not correct. And so the Bible is one of their authoritative books, but the truth is that if you were ranking them, it is not, uh, it, it would probably be the fourth of the four books that they list. The second one is the Book of Mormon. Now this, this little copy, this actually came from a, uh, a Latter-day Saint. This was his personal copy. Uh, it contains the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. And I'll be quoting from some of this as we go through. Uh, the most important is the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith said, I'm quoting, the most correct book of any book on earth the keystone of our religion a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts more than any other book that's a strong statement isn't it when you read what John wrote the very last basically the last statement of the book of Revelation you remember what he wrote John said, and if anyone takes away from the words of this prophetic book, God will take away his share of the tree of life and the holy city written in this book. We've been reading in the book of Galatians. Paul said, uh, if anyone preaches to you anything other than the gospel that we have preached, let him be cursed. And Joseph Smith said that the book he wrote, the Book of Mormon, is the most authoritative, correct, helpful book on earth. The third is the Doctrine and Covenants. It's a collection of more modern revelations. Of course, Joseph Smith himself would be rather modern, wouldn't he? Uh, having written all of this in the 1800s, but this would be revelations that came even after Joseph Smith. And then the Pearl of Great Price. It's the fourth book to be inspired, and it, it just offers some clarity and some understanding. I have one more book here that I'm going to read from. This is not one of their uh, holy books. This is called The Gospel Principles. It is published by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So this is their book. And this is basically what a person in their church would take to read to understand what all of their uh, writings teach. It's kind of a, it's not a Reader's Digest version. I don't mean to imply that. But it is kind of a learner's uh, cumulative, taking the most important things out of all of their writings very little of the Bible in here, just to be honest with you, but a lot of their other writings, and I'll be reading from some of that in just a moment as well. Uh, the Mormon church president is also regarded as a seer, revelator, translator, and prophet. Bruce mentioned last week that when the Pope, in Catholicism, when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, which means from the throne, that what he says has the same weight, it has the same importance as the Word of God. He is speaking for God, when he speaks ex cathedra, when the uh, president of the Mormon church speaks, it is the same way. He is speaking for God. By the way, the current president is a man named Russell Nelson. He was elected in January of this year, and he is the 17th president of the Church of Latter-day Saints. So what's the difference between that, what the, their scripture and authority, and us? Well, the big contrast between the Bible and the Book of Mormon is a historical record. The Bible has... Uh, a history of uh, accuracy. We, we have many, many examples of how the Bible uh, has proven itself to be true over and over. The Bible says of itself that it is the inerrant Word of God. In 2 Timothy 3, 16, how many of you believe that the Bible is the inerrant Word of God? I do too. 
It is authoritative in every subject it addresses. And as Christians, we hold the Bible to be the final authority on truth. This is important. The Bible doesn't tell us about truth. The Bible is truth. The Bible doesn't point us to truth. The Bible is truth. The Bible doesn't contain truth. The Bible is truth. The Bible is the Word of God. And as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, and when we were trying to look at what we believe, it is our it is our sole authority for faith and practice. Now, I've given you a couple of things here that are interesting. Uh, there are 25,000 different manuscripts that, that validate. We don't need it to be validated because the Bible says of itself that it is the Word of God. But there are 25,000 different manuscripts that document that and, and, and let us know the truth of that. Um, this may be off the subject a little bit, but since we're talking about the authority of Scripture, I'll take, a, take just a minute and do this. You know, when you're talking about the, the, um, the Scripture, when we're talking about the Bible and a preacher, when I say the original language says, you understand that we don't have any of the original documents. That those are called autographs, and we don't have any of the original autographs. None. Not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. We have no originals. So it's important, and this is why you have differences in translations. We've got so many translations, New International, um, uh, New American, uh, Today's English. I use the Holman Christian Standard, King James. There are all these different translations. And one of the reasons that there are nuances and differences there is because throughout history, new um, fragments, new pieces of, of ancient scripture has, has been located. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, for example, in the, in, in the 1940s. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, those at that time became the oldest documents to compare what we have as scripture with that got back as close to the, to the oldest as at that point as we could get. So in the 1940s, that was hundreds of years after the King James Version had been written, right? So what, what scholars try to do is to get back as close as they can to the original documents. Now I have here a, a copy of a magazine. This is Christianity Today. And the, sto the, the article is about a discovery that's happened in this decade. Actually the discovery happened a long time ago. It was in a, um, a, a, a garbage dump in Egypt. And when some excavation was taking place, they found in the dump just uh, a, a, a treasure trove of documents of various kinds. And so they took all these documents and they have, they have uh, handed them off to museums and, and uh, scholars. And only 1%, only 1% of those documents that came out of that dump have, have been examined to this point. But this article is about what is now believed to be the oldest copy of the Gospel of Mark that was found in that dump. Now up until that time, the oldest copy of the Gospel of Mark that we had, and, and Mark was the oldest of the books of the New Testament. It was the first one that was written. And the oldest one that we had was in about the late second century. But this one, they believe, goes back all the way to the, to the last part of the first century. So the closer you can get to the original, the closer you're going to get to the original writing. And the amazing thing is how, how little the nuances and differences are between what we have in our scripture and what these documents are showing. So now it's that kind of, that, that's what I'm talking about in this in this statement right here that's talking about all these different thousands of manuscripts. We have 25,000 different manuscripts that go back into the Old Testament and the New Testament that get as far back as we can go. None of them are originals, but they get as close to the originals as we can get. 25,000 that verify that what we have as Scripture is accurate. The, the second most documented ancient document, if you look inside, the second most documented thing that we have in history is Homer's Iliad. And there are 643 surviving manuscripts that they base that on. 643 compared to 
25,000. And in Mormonism, you're talking about something that was written a couple of hundred years ago by a 15-year-old boy who said that a, an, an angel came and told him where to find some golden tablets. And by the way, there's no archaeological evidence of any of that. There's no historical evidence. His writings talk about places that nobody, there's no verification of any of it. And in Scripture, there is all kinds of verification. So let's talk about God. What does the Mormon church teach about God? Let me read something to you. This is coming straight from the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. This is what he said. Now, I'm not, I am not making a commentary. I'm reading what he wrote. You listen with your ears to what he said. God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret if the veil were rent today and the great God who holds this world in its orbit and who, who upholds all worlds and all things by his power was to make himself visible, I say, if you were to see him today, you would see him like a man in form, like yourselves, in all the person, image, and the very form as a man. For Adam was created in the very fashion, image, and likeness of God and received instruction from and walked and talked and conversed with him as one man talks and communes with another. God himself was once as we are now. God was a man first. And he became God. Now, you compare that with uh, what we believe. By the way, they, uh, they talk about the Trinity. They will talk about God the Father, and they will talk about Jesus, and they will talk about the Holy... They don't say Holy Spirit, they say Holy Ghost. But they see that as three completely different entities. We believe that God has revealed himself in three different ways. That there is one God. His name is Yahweh. God is in heaven... But God is spirit. God is not flesh and blood. The Bible is very clear about that, isn't it? God is spirit. We will know him in spirit. God is a spirit. And that Jesus is his son. Jesus is God who came to earth. That's what the name Emmanuel means. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. God left heaven and came to earth to be with us. And Jesus said, if I go away, the Holy Spirit will come. The Holy Spirit is God inside of us. Now, here's the, here's the amazing thing about this. When, when Jesus came to earth, God did not vacate heaven. God was still in heaven, but God came to earth in the form of a man named Jesus. And when God is in us in the Holy Spirit, God has not left heaven to be in us in the Holy Spirit because we think in terms of time and space. And God is not limited by time and space. You know, one of the first questions Jesus, uh, children always ask when they start thinking philosophically. They don't use that word. But when they start thinking. Children want to know, well, who made God? And when did God show up? And God has always been. Nobody made God. God is God. And the problem is when you ask the question... Who made God and when did God appear? That's a time and space question. And God is not limited by time and space. Time and space is something, uh, it's a dimension that we know in this world. God is not limited to that. So we're asking a question and we can't understand the answer to it anyway. I, I'm really kind of glad that I, I can't fit everything about God into my pea-sized brain. He wouldn't be a really big God if I could figure him all out. God is a whole lot bigger than what I'm able to comprehend. And sometimes people worry me that make me think, or try to make me think, that they got it all figured out. I don't have it all figured out. But God has always been. God wasn't a man and became a God. God is God and always has been. So they believe that God uh, is an exalted man. He has physical body, flesh and bone. Three separate entities. We believe that there's one God. God has always been. God is a spirit, no flesh and bones. And that the Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All right, let's talk about Jesus. What do they say about Jesus? Well, let me read a little bit more to you. This is what it says. Jesus was, I'm, I'm quoting from there. I'm quoting from this book, uh, Gospel Principles. Jesus was the spiritual firstborn of God in pre-existence. 
Every person who is ever born on earth was our spirit brother or sister in heaven. And you've got to understand that what they're saying, and you'll probably pick some of this up as I read some more in a minute. They believe that before you and I came to earth that we were all in heaven. We were spirit beings in heaven and we were brothers and sisters with Jesus and Satan. And Jesus went one way and Satan went the other. And God sent us to earth so that we would sin. That's what they say, so that we would sin. So that then he could restore us to bring us back to heaven where we were to start with. But Jesus was a, the first pre-existent child of God and his wife. God has a wife in heaven, in this spirit. And God and his wife, their first spirit child was Jesus. And he is our older brother. And, uh, and we are all brothers and sisters. All right, this is what they say about Jesus. This is why he came to earth. Christ thus overcame physical death because of his atonement. That's a word we use. Everyone born on this earth will be resurrected. This is the condition called immortality. All people who ever lived will be resurrected, both old and young, bond and free, male and female, both the wicked and the righteous. Now, what do we believe about Jesus? Well, we believe that he was born of a Virgin Mary. Joseph was his earthly father, but he was not his physical father. God was his father. Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He is the second person of the Trinity. He is God in the flesh. Uh, he is God, but in the flesh he is man. He is creator of all things. What do they say about mankind? Well, let me read a little bit to you out of this book. I'm quoting the book. God is not only our ruler and creator, he is also our heavenly father. All men and women are literally the sons and daughters of deity. Man as a spirit was begotten and born of heavenly parents and reared to maturity in the eternal mansions of the Father prior to coming to earth in your physical body. Every person who was ever born on earth was our spirit brother or sister in heaven. The first spirit born to our eternal parents was Jesus Christ. So he is literally our elder brother. Because we are spiritual children of our heavenly parents, we have inherited. Now listen, don't get lost on this. Because we are the spiritual children of our heavenly parents, we have inherited the potential to develop their divine qualities. If we choose to do so, we can become perfect just as they are. You get that? As we are, God was, and as God is, we will become. We will become a God. You believe that? When the plan for our salvation was presented to us in the spirit world, we were so happy, we shouted for joy. Any of you remember doing that? We understood that we would have to leave. I said I wasn't going to make commentary. I apologize. I'm just reading. We understood that we would have to leave our heavenly home for a time. We would not live in the presence of our heavenly parents. While we were away from them, all of us would sin and some of us would lose our way. Jesus was willing to come to earth, give his life for us, and take upon himself our sins. He, like our heavenly father, wanted us to choose whether we would obey heavenly father's commandments. Now there's the first hint that I've said about salvation is by works. Everybody is saved by Jesus. Everybody. But then you decide by your works if you're going to go to heaven or not. He knew that we must be free to choose in order to prove ourselves worthy of exaltation. You get that? Exaltation? That means becoming God. Satan, who was called Lucifer, also came saying, Behold, here am I, send me. I will be thy son and I will redeem all mankind that one soul shall not be lost and surely I will do it. Wherefore, give me that honor. Satan wanted to force us all to do his will. Under his plan, we would not be allowed to choose. He would take away the freedom of choice that our father had given us. Satan, now listen to this phrase, Satan wanted to have all the honor for our salvation. Now compare that to what he's saying about Jesus. Jesus didn't want to have all the honor for our salvation. So Jesus was going to come to earth so that everybody would be resurrected. But then you decide. 
And your salvation will be based on what you do. He's done his part. Now you've got to do your part. Satan wanted to just make it so that it was a gift that he offered. Well, isn't that what Jesus did for us? Isn't that really what grace is? It's not what we deserve. After hearing both sons speak, Heavenly Father said, I will send the first. Because our Heavenly Father chose Jesus to be our Savior, Satan became angry and rebelled. There was a war in heaven. Satan and his followers fought against Jesus and his followers. In this great rebellion, Satan and all the spirits who followed him were sent away from the presence of God and cast down from heaven. One third of the spirits in heaven were punished for following Satan. They were denied the right to receive mortal bodies. By following the Lord's teachings, we can return to live with him and our heavenly parents in the celestial kingdom. He was chosen to be our Savior when we all attended the great council with our heavenly parents. When he became our Savior, he did his part to help us return to our heavenly home. It is now up to each of us to do our part and become worthy of exaltation. You do your part and you can become a God. So that's, that's what they believe about Mankind. Notice that, um, notice that phrase there under, under the mankind, the last thing there, their, their fifth president said, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may become. So God was a man who became God, and, and you are a man who can become a God as well. What does the Bible teach? That we are all God's adopted children, Romans chapter 8. What about sin? Well, uh, they believe, their scripture says that uh, Adam's fall is a part of God's plan. Uh, let me just read this to you rather than me trying to remember it. Let me read it. This is what it says. Some people believe Adam and Eve committed serious sin when they ate of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. How many of you believe that? I do. However... Latter-day scriptures help us understand that their fall was a necessary step in the plan of life and a great blessing to all of us. Because of the fall, we are blessed with physical bodies, the right to choose between good and evil, and the opportunity to gain eternal life. None of these privileges would have been ours had Adam and Eve not sinned. After the fall, Eve said, Were it not for our transgressions, we would have never had children and never should have known good and evil and the joy of our redemption and the eternal life which God gives to all the obedient. Adam fell that men might be and men are that they might have joy. That is certainly not what the Bible teaches about sin. What about salvation? Notice that first line. Jesus' atonement provides immortality for, what's the word? All people. So when Mr. Romney or anybody else says, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior who died on the cross for my sins, they would say that for every person on earth. Jesus died for everybody and now it is your choice. He did his part. So now it's up to you to keep all of the teachings and all of the rules and all of the laws and baptism and sacred marriage and tithe and all of those things. And it's you doing those things that are going to take care of your sin and get you to where you want to be. Mormons have a pretty complicated uh, view of salvation. Exaltation is a word that they use. You and I use that word. Uh, but we mean something different. They mean Godhood. When they use the word exaltation, they're talking about becoming a God. And it is only available, again, I'm reading now. This is from uh, uh, Doctrines and Covenants. This is what it says. It is available only to Mormons through the obedience to Latter-day Saints' teachings regarding faith, baptism, temple endowment, celestial marriage, and tithing. Here is what they believe that an exalted individual will, will receive. So if, if you make it to that level, you become a God. You are going to live eternally in the presence of the Heavenly Father. You're going to become a God. You're going to have a righteous family. Uh, you're going to receive fullness of joy. And you'll have everything that our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ have. All power, all glory, all dominion. Everything that they have, you will have as well. And by the way, baptism for the dead provides you an opportunity to help someone who is non-Mormon and you can take care of their eternity uh, in their absence if you choose to do that. It has to happen in the temple. 
but, but a Mormon can do that for someone else. What do we believe about salvation? Well, we believe that we're separated from God because we're all sinners. Jesus died on a cross to make it possible for us to have a relationship with God. And forgiveness is, a, is an act of, of God's grace. It, we don't earn it. The Bible's very clear about that. The doctrine of eternal things. The next little section there, life after death. This is kind of complicated as well. They have three levels, if you will, of uh, eternity. Remember the old Sears catalog? When, when you, you go through there at Christmas time and start picking stuff out, remember when they had the good and the better and the best? My mom and daddy always made me stop with good, but, but uh, you know, you, you just kind of oogle over the best. Well, I kind of get the feeling of that when you're looking at these three different levels, although one of them's not good, one of them's bad. But here it is. This is what they believe. Exaltation, remember that means becoming God, Godhood. Exaltation in the celestial kingdom is for faithful Mormons where people may become gods and angels. Their uh, uh, doctrines and covenants said they shall be gods. The terrestrial kingdom is where you and I probably will end up. Uh, it's for righteous people. We're good folks. We're just not Mormons. And so we get to go to this kind of second level, uh, if you will. These are those who are honorable people of the earth, but we were blinded by the craftiness of men. And then the third is the terrestrial kingdom. This is for wicked people, the ungodly people. Now, they don't call it hell. They, they talk about hell, but hell is really, there are going to be very few um, uh, human beings in hell. They, they, they don't really see uh, that biblical teaching. Uh, they, they think that ungodly people and wicked people are going to be in this third level. And, and we just, they, or they just won't have uh, the, the blessings that other people have. So what do they believe about hell? Did I put this in here? Yeah. Uh, what is their view of hell? It's, it's called outer darkness, but it's temporary. So even if you do have somebody that ends up there, it won't be for long. And they'll get out. And they'll get to go to that third level. Uh, Satan and his angels are the only ones who will be there forever. Um, and there's nothing they, I, I guess there's nothing they can do about that. What do we believe? We believe that hell is a literal permanent dwelling for those who've rejected God's plan. That eternal life in heaven with God is for those who have trusted in Jesus Christ. All right, let me give you a couple of other things before we stop. Oh, we got just a couple more minutes. Let me, uh, you can make some notes of this if you want to. Let me give you a couple of thoughts about how to witness to a Mormon. Uh, one thing is just use the Bible. Just use the Bible. Just keep going back to the Bible and keep talking about Jesus and talk about grace and help them to understand what grace really means. That we're not saved by our works. Go to the passages in the Bible in Ephesians that say that it is not by your works. It's not by your goodness or what we've done. It's what he has done. Talk about the passages in Galatians that we've been studying about God's grace. Focus on those things. Be aware that if you have a Mormon friend that they are, um, they may appear very self-assured. But they have a lot of doubt inside of them because their ability to please God is based on, on what they do. And if they haven't done well enough, they are a little bit uh, fearful about that. They're never really sure that they have done enough uh, to measure up. There was a passage that I was going to read about that, and I don't, I don't remember which of the writings it was in, but um, th th they are really not ever sure that they have have done enough so focus on grace talk about grace uh, when you're trying to talk to a Mormon person what are some of the key differences we've already talked about these but let me just kind of uh, run over them again one is that Mormonism puts a very heavy burden of works on uh, its followers you've got to earn this uh, here's what I was looking for to read to you this is from the uh, Book of Mormon, I'm quoting. It says, Have you walked, keeping yourselves blameless before God? Could you say, if you were called to die at this time within yourselves, that you have been sufficiently humble? Have you been entirely stripped of your pride? If not, you cannot meet God. Come to Christ and be perfected in Him and deny yourself of all ungodliness. Deny yourself of, 
of, of, of everything evil. Love God with all your mind and heart. And then his grace is sufficient for you. The, the weight of this is on you. Now there's a sharp contrast between that and what we believe about God's grace. Another difference is, and you picked up on this as I was talking about it, is their view of their scriptures being so different from our understanding of the Bible. The Bible is truth. It is the Word of God. There are a lot more differences. Uh, the, the ability to become a God. How many of you in here believe that you're going to become a God when you get to heaven? How many of you in here believe that God was a man and he kind of climbed the ladder and became a God? How many of you in here believe that Jesus and Satan were brothers? And that Satan wanted to come. He asked if he could come and he could die for us. But God chose to let Jesus do that. And Satan got mad about that. Uh, they don't believe that there's any original sin. Uh, the Bible is very clear. The book of Romans says that through Adam, sin entered into by one man. And, and, and it goes on to say by one man, salvation is offered. And, and Jesus became the New Testament antithesis of, of Adam. And then, of course, the idea that God has a physical body. That's very different than what the Bible says. Well, I think I've covered most of what I wanted to say to you tonight. Um, I think that about gets it. So, if I miss something, Wikipedia. Google it. Thank you for coming tonight. Remember next week the children will be in here at 6. We'll start at 6.30 and we'll be talking about the difference between us and Jehovah's Witnesses. All right, let me lead us in a prayer. Father, thank you tonight. We're not bashing. We're not really trying to be critical. We're just looking to understand what a group believes and we're trying to look at what their books actually say. This is what they say. This is what the book tells us. And we're trying to compare that to scriptural truth. Lord, as we have opportunity, all of us know someone that's uh, a part of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. They're very faithful people. They're good people. They're moral. They're good neighbors. Good friends. But they don't have a relationship, a true biblical relationship with Jesus Christ. And by definition of what the New Testament says, this is not Christianity. This is a cult. And so help us as we talk with people that come into our path that we can point them to the true biblical historical Jesus who offers salvation by grace, not by what we do, but by what he did that offers us salvation as a free gift. Thank you for the time we've had to study. I pray that this is helpful and beneficial in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night.